Amen. Well, good work. Thank you. Uh, in all fairness to me, I was taking the garbage out when I walked outside, and the Mormons were talking to the family, and I thought, you know, they're going to be just fine. They're doing a great job. Well, good morning, West Valley Four Square Church. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you for being here, choosing to be a part of the church with us in person and those of you joining us online. Uh, did you bring your Bibles today? Well, no, it's, it's bizarre. Church, Bible, I don't get the connection, but we'll try. Uh, so, no, if you can. So open your Bible or Bible app to Acts chapter 2. Man, Pentecost, are you ready? So Acts chapter 2. So uh, I've been asking, bring your Bible with you for the next few weeks or months or years, however long we're in Acts uh, together. No, just months. But we will uh, we'll enjoy studying together. We'll continue to have handouts, of course. But I just want to encourage you, maybe write in your Bible or bring a notebook or a journal because hopefully... Um, as my job is, and hopefully I'll do a good job of teaching some stuff that might be kind of new. I mean, this is certainly my educational journey, having been raised in a very Pentecostal, spirit-filled lifestyle church. As I study, I come across stuff that's new, and I sometimes I'm like, man, how have I never heard this before? Scripture is so rich and deep, and I hope to pass that on to you so that we fall in love with God's Word over and over again. So bring your paper Bible with you to church, if you will. And I think that you'll be glad you did. Well, Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. So we're, in a, we're talking about Acts, and last week we started off talking about the importance of understanding that the book of Acts, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, comes to us as actually a sequel. It's part two, written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel according to Luke, which of course is all about Jesus, in order to make sense of what is about to unfold for the next few weeks as we talk about Acts and lots of interesting things that happen. This really bizarre, weird groupings of people that come together that will be called the church, to miracles, to cities literally being shaken, sometimes in a good way for God, sometimes riots form because of the movement of the Holy Spirit and the, the, the actions of the church. All this stuff will only make sense if we know part one of the story, which is Jesus's life and teaching and the death, burial, and resurrection. And then Luke moves into the book of Acts. It's part two of his series. Is that helpful? So if we can get that, man, all of a sudden it makes more sense that Jesus had risen from the dead before we even opened the book of Acts. And then we open the book of Acts and we recognize that he ascended. And last week we talked about the importance of the ascension. Why is that important? Because Jesus said, I have to ascend so that I can send you the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? The ascension is very important to the church. So if you missed that last week, I hope you'll consider getting on the app and listening to the message and checking out those notes. Okay, Acts chapter 2. Are we ready? 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven the sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were seated. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished. And they said, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? That is to say, aren't these guys country bumpkins from the south? That's, this is what's implied by Galilean, uneducated, sort of, how is, it, how is it that we hear each of us speaking in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. And the visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty work of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked and said they are filled with new wine. That is to say they are drunk. Have you ever been drunk and spoken another language fluently? <laughs> I don't, we'll talk about that connection in a minute, but I don't know that I see it right away. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. So a great place to start. What's Pentecost? What even is Pentecost? Well, it turns out it's a holiday. Now, for those of us that are raised in the church, we might have a completely different answer, like, oh, Pentecost is this really special 
thing, which it is. But if we go back to the text, let's just go back here for a minute. It's a holiday. That's really all it is. The Jewish people in Hebrew would have called it Shavuot. And it comes from Exodus 34. It's the Feast of Weeks. That's what it is. That's what Shavuot means. It's the Feast of Weeks. It's a holiday that comes. So it's after the great Exodus of Egypt where God institutes the Passover, this holiday called the Passover that they would celebrate once a year. And they were supposed to eventually, over the course of time, go to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. Fifty days later, they're supposed to celebrate another holiday called Shavuot in, in Greek, Pentecost, Pente meaning 50. That's why it's so Shavuot and Pentecost are the same, just different languages. Is that helpful already? So 50 days after Passover, they're supposed to celebrate. Really, it's, um, it's a harvest festival, the end of the barley harvest, the, end of the, the beginning of the wheat harvest. But really what we recognize is that what Shavuot, what Feast of Weeks began to mean is it's when the Israelites went to the Mount, of si Mount Sinai in the, after the Exodus, and God gives them the law. He makes a covenant with Israel that you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. So the Feast of Weeks celebrates the giving of the law and the Feast of Weeks celebrates a unique relationship with God that the Israelites would have had. Hold on to that because that's, will be, that will be important. So Feast of Weeks celebrates that Israel will be God's unique people in the world. Are you tracking with me? Okay, so it's a holiday. So people are visiting Jerusalem because this is what you do. And it just so happens the Passover that we're talking about that had recently happened was the Passover some 50 days ago where Jesus was crucified, buried, and had resurrected. So we're very close to the resurrection, and this is the holiday that we're talking about. Is that helpful? Okay, so this is a big celebration. It brought in lots of visitors. And as we unpack this account of the Holy Spirit coming down on and into people, and they began to speak these other earthly languages, I think we should approach this whole account, this whole, this morning, let's all agree with Acts 2.12. Let's approach it like these guys did. And they asked, say it with me, what does this mean? This is kind of weird. What is this sound and all this stuff that's happening? So let's keep that before us this morning. What does this mean? Okay, so suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. What does this mean? Well, it means at least one thing. It's external. This is something that came from outside of them, came from heaven, came from the presence of God. It wasn't something that was just internal inside of them where they all of a sudden got some epiphany or some revelation and they felt something. No, it was something from outside of them. It was external. So the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind. Think of the force, think of the power, think of the sound of a hurricane, right? That's loud. That's probably why it got the attention of the people who were in the area from where this was happening in an upper room. They heard it and they felt it. There was no guessing or questions about that. It was loud. Have you ever been in a hurricane? Has anyone ever been in a hurricane or a severe storm? Of course, Louisiana, of course you have, right? So any, yeah, a few people... Yeah, that's amazing. And you, I'm sure it's loud, right? It's just, it's probably raucous. It's probably a little nerve wracking, all the noise. I think the closest I've been, they have this machine at Get Air. Have you seen it? The hurricane machine? <laughs> you pay a couple dollars and you close it. And then when you stand in it, it's just, it's loud. And you know. <laughs> My kids love that one at Get Air. So the hurricane machine, that's, that's what you get. So this was not some quiet experience. I think this is so important for us to hear. This was not just felt inside by a few people. So we cannot write this off as a psychological or an emotional experience. This was something that was outside of them. Or like many other religions that have begun where some leader, uh, no, I mean, no offense by this, but I certainly think Islam and Mormonism fit into this category, where some individual leader goes off and they've received this amazing revelation, they say, or they, they received this amazing vision and then they were the only ones there. It was a secu secluded place. And then now they're bringing back this revelation to the rest of the people to say what God has said. This is not what's happening in the book of Acts. Can you see the difference? There's some 120 people in this room, according to Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. And something from outside of them, greater than them, more powerful than them, comes inside and just gets the attention of everyone in the area. So that's different. The presence of God, the Holy Spirit, was an outside help. And it's an outside help that they needed and that we all need. Just like Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we talked about this 
Last week, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. Yeah, my witnesses. Okay, so outside help from God himself. Now, this is also important. This is another step in God's plan of salvation history. When you look at the, old, the whole Bible, you begin to see that God is working sort of in distinct movements and that there really is this overall plan. Uh, German theologians called it Hilgeschichte. I think it's just a really tough word to say. It's kind of fun. Everybody try Hilgeschichte. Yeah, it, so German theology came up with this idea that it's salvation history. That's what that word means. Yeah, did you spit all over someone, BJ? Sorry about that, Marianne, if he, bleh. So they, they, they coined this term, and it really, it means salvation history. There's a plan of God from beginning to end, and there are these really big steps that happen. So, for example, you have a covenant with Abraham, and he, he inaugurates what will become the Hebrew people, and then we fast forward through Passover and Exodus, and now we have the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost that we're talking about, where they're celebrating God making sure that they know that they are his chosen people. Here's my law. Here's the Torah. Here's, here's a covenant that I, I will be, this covenant, I will be your God and you will be my people. And now here at Pentecost, Jesus had ascended. I hope you see this. Jesus had ascended and said, I have to ascend so that I can send you the promise of the Holy Spirit because there's another step in God's plan of salvation history to give not a new covenant or not necessarily the, the Torah or the law, but God's ratifying or fulfilling the new covenant that had been promised by giving the Holy Spirit. So that means we're in a whole new time phase in human history. That's profound. It's not accidental that it was Pentecost holiday, Feast of Weeks, where God decides that he would send the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's a whole new covenant. It's a whole new paradigm because of the resurrection of Jesus. That's rich, guys. That's amazing what God has done. So it's, it, um, it is interesting that when I think about that, this whole sort of paradigm, it's interesting to me when we think of the outside power of the Holy Spirit the way the world talks to us or the way the culture talks to us. We ask, what does this mean? Well, I think maybe we've heard this so much that we're maybe blind to it or maybe deaf to it. But here's what you hear. Man, it's on the commercials. It's, it's just sort of, it's the culture. Everything you need, you have on the inside of you. Don't we hear that? Everything you need to find joy, meaning, purpose, your identity, whatever you want it to be, everything you need is on the inside of you. You just have to tap, in, tap into it. You need to learn to become your authentic self. Isn't that what we hear? But guess what? Christianity says the opposite. Christianity teaches that you need some outside help. Outside as in supernatural, right? Not of this world and its broken and opinionated self. You need some intervention from the God who loves us enough to tell us the truth and is powerful and compassionate enough to do something about it. That's what we need. More and more, the culture is saying, the problem, actually, the problem is out there. The problem is with you guys, because you don't see the world the way I see it. You don't support or agree with what I agree with, so you're the problem, not me, right? Social injustices, racism, bitterness, hatred, bigotry, prejudice, judgment, all the list, the problem is out there with all y'all and not with me. I have the answers because I understand that those things are wrong. The problems are out there with you, not with me. Everything I need is inside of me. I just got to learn to tap into it. I think this is funny, but a New, York arm, uh, New York Times article not that long ago confirms this. They had noticed that there was a decline actually in counseling and therapy. And so the Times decided to do an article on it. And they discovered that years ago, people would come to counseling and therapy and they would say, I need help understanding myself because I need to change. But now, however, people are saying the problems are out there and they need to change. So the counselor being interviewed by the time said this, I'd see fewer and fewer people coming to me saying I want to change. So from a branding perspective, this was pretty simple. I switched from I treat people with depression and anxiety to are you having trouble with difficult people in your life? <laughs> I think this is so true because it shows how self-centered we are as a people doesn't it? I think sometimes we're actually so self-centered. I wonder if we're even, we're blinded to how self-centered we really are. And if we continue, church, those of us here, those listening online, those of us that uh, will have conversations that hopefully this helps with the people in our life, 
where they feel like this is the truth and they're believing the lies of the culture. But if we continue to adopt this idea that the problem is out there with other people and I'm not the problem and maybe I do have everything in me, I just have to tap into it. Guess what? That's actually a really dark place to be because you can't, you can't control other people. You can't find joy and peace and happiness if you are trying to wait for other people to change. That's why live with that angst and stress your whole life. You cannot change other people. So when we take the step and we begin to realize that the truth is that I'm part of the problem, you're part of the problem, that's actually good news. There's hope now because by God's grace, I can change. You can change. Is that right? We need outside help. So the world says that the problem is out there and the solution is in here. But God says the problem is in here. <laughs> and the solution is the power of God out there, outside of yourself. So that's what we recognize. Okay, so then in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, we see that uh, divided flames or tongues of fire had appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Again, we ask with the people who were drawn into this situation, what does this mean? What does this mean? Sorry, my contacts all of a sudden are being kind of blurry. You guys are all blurry all of a sudden. <laughs> Sorry about that. Maybe I'll make this bigger. Okay, so individual tongues or flames of fire are appearing on all of those who are in the room. And we ask this question, what does this mean? Well, it means a few things, but certainly notice... Notice that it appeared on all who were there. Everybody say all. All 120 or so of how many people were in the upper room. And also notice this. Whenever God shows up in the Old Testament in kind of this uh, powerful presence, divine kind of way, we often see that it's depicted as fire. So for example, when God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, we see that he was a flaming torch. Or when he appeared to Moses, he was a burning bush, a bush that was burning but yet not consumed in Exodus chapter 3. Then he made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai like we've been talking about, and we see in Exodus 19 smoke and fire surrounding the mountain. Uh, when the Israelites were wandering through the desert, he was a pillar of fire. Do we see that? So I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. The prophet Ezekiel had a vision of God where he saw the throne room and fire was everywhere, Ezekiel chapter one. So fire in the Old Testament was a demonstration of this sort of glorious and divine presence of God throughout the Old Testament and sometimes it was even fatal. And here at Pentecost, the presence of God is resting on each of them, male and female, and they begin to speak in different languages. So this means that the presence of God was not only on them, but the presence of God came into them. And so when we put our faith, they began to speak in these other languages, when we put our faith and confidence in Jesus, we will get to be these, the whole point is we get to be these little burning bushes of fire everywhere in the world. God's presence on the inside of us. So the amazing power that we see in God's presence in the Old Testament, now gets to be on the inside of us. That's amazing. That's a huge shift from Old Testament way of living to New Testament way of living. This is absolutely profound. And again, notice that this happened to everyone in the room, not just the 11 disciples, not just the 11 apostles who were there. Again, with the crowd, we say, what does this mean? Well, if anybody was ordained, I know that we talk about how the disciples blew it all the time, and we talk about how Scripture is raw, and it exposes us to their embarrassing details. But even in the midst of that, with the 11 disciples, they were handpicked by Jesus, right? So if anybody was special, are you tracking with me? If anybody was ordained or qualified to receive the Holy Spirit, it would be these 11. But that's not what happens all of the people who were present in the upper room received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's substantial, right? That's significance. It means that no one is more holy or more qualified than someone else to receive the love and the grace and the presence of God in their life. Amen. It means that the very presence of God can come into your life and you can know that you really are a child of God whom he loves and he adores and he has a plan 
for your life if you choose to follow him wholeheartedly. Why do I say being filled with the Holy Spirit gives you this knowledge or sense of being a child of God? Because when Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3, the Spirit of God descends on Jesus. The voice of God the Father said, this is my beloved Son. And so he received sonship, or he didn't receive it, but we recognize sonship by the, the coming of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus. And then Paul in Romans chapter 8 says this, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And again in Galatians, he says, and because you are sons, sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. That's daddy God. That's relational term, daddy God. So when we have the power, when we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, we get that confidence, that assurance that we belong to God because his spirit is inside of us. Who would love to have that confidence in their life today? or people in our life that know they need that confidence. That's one of the amazing truths of what is happening here at Pentecost is the presence of God is coming in and confirming sonship. This should be an inc- this also gives people an incredible boldness. I think this is awesome and funny at the same time. But it gives us an incredible boldness in our life as we live for Jesus and we don't live for ourselves. And and it draws us closer to him. And as we learn scripture and we study scripture, we will be continually amazed over and over again at how powerful and profound God's love is and his grace is that it only draws us closer to him. When you study scripture, that's what happens. Jesus is elevated and God is magnified and you fall in love with him all over again as you study scripture. You're drawn into him and his way. And when we really get this concept, we tap into it, we lean in, and in on the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, we become dependent upon him and his presence in our life, what does it look like? Well, it looks different. It, just, it, does, it doesn't look like the way of the world. It doesn't. It looks very, very different. And we're going to see the fruit of this fulfillment of being filled with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. These guys live different. They don't play by the world's rules. And sometimes it's frustrating. What gives you the right to live with peace? What gives you the right to live with joy in your life when the world is falling apart or all this stuff is so bad politically or socially? What gives you the right to live a life of peace and contentment and not playing the game of wanting bigger, better, more? So it's a power inside of you. It can be frustrating to others because maybe they just don't get it. And so we see in verses 12 and 13 that they stood there amazed. The crowd stood there amazed. What does this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them and said, They're just drunk. Again, I don't know why they jumped to that conclusion. First of all, it's nine in the morning here. And number two, they're speaking in languages they understand, but the Galileans don't know. So why would they jump to this conclusion? Here's a thought that you can just think about. So because they were joyful, because they were fearless. And that's when we lost power to the whole building. (laughs) So we wanted to make sure and finish the message so that you could hear how it concludes. But isn't it an interesting thing in Acts chapter 2 that the, the crowd ridiculed them and said, they're just drunk, that's all. What, why do you suppose they jumped to that conclusion? I that's such a, fasc- I mean, such a fascinating thing. I don't know anybody who's ever been drunk that starts speaking another language fluently that they don't know. But I think there might be more to the story here. I think, why could they have jumped to that conclusion? Well, maybe, maybe it's because they, the crowd, the disciples, the 120 that were filled with the Holy Spirit were were sort of joyful, maybe. Maybe it's because they were fearless. I mean, this was spilling out into the streets, and they were boldly and confidently, with no inhibition, they were speaking the message of Jesus. What are people like when they're drunk? Think about that. Well, when people are drunk, you know, I, they're fearless, aren't they? Oftentimes, they're, they're usually pretty silly. They're pretty joyful. And, of course, they're stupid. I and mean, that's just part of being drunk. When you're drunk, you're dumb, right? Alcohol is a depressant, right? It, that is to say that it, it slows the brain function. And, and reality kind of fades away from your mind for a moment, for that time when the alcohol is in your system. And when people are drunk, the issues of life are suppressed, 
And it's sort of like they have this momentary state of freedom, right? And, and they seem happy. It's phony and it's temporary and it's not a real fix, but isn't that kind of what we do? And I think that there's, a, there's an interesting connection. When people are drunk and they have this sort of momentary freedom and joy for just a minute, I think Paul's tapping onto something here. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, he writes this to the church at Ephesus. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. That's a pretty, that's a pretty rich passage, especially if we consider the accusations here in Acts chapter 2. These guys are filled with the Holy Spirit, but no, they're just drunk. Should, should it be then that we face life's troubles rather than trying to escape life's troubles through some sort of alcohol? or some depressant, you know, where we just sort of, let's just detach for a minute, but face them with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, who in the midst of reality can still offer freedom and joy inside of you. Man, what a powerful thought. Don't try to escape your problems by trying to find them at the bottom of the glass, this freedom, but overcome them by the power of God's Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in us, and we understand that this is God's loving and powerful presence in us, man, we really can have a more carefree sense of life. We really can. We can have a life that's a little more fearless, right? A little bit more bold and uninhibited with the message that we have and the love that we should bring and the forgiveness and hope that we should bring to those around us, uninhibited with the message of Jesus and his truth. Not because, like alcohol, we're ignoring or suppressing reality and the issues of life in this world, but because with the power, the real honest power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, we can face those problems head on with a confidence and a security that only God can provide. Now, of course, when I say that, it doesn't mean we're never sad or we don't have sorrow and things happen in our life. I'm not talking about your head in the clouds and being detached from reality. Quite the opposite. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you face real life head on, but you still have a sense of freedom and a sense of joy deep down in who you are. Why? Because we have outside help, right? We have the power of God working on the inside of us. And the last main point I wanted to share in this message is that in Acts chapter 2, as we're asking with the crowd, what does this mean? It means that it's a universal message. Luke records in verses 5 through 8 that there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound of the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each was hearing them speak in his own language. Right, And they were amazed and astonished and said, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? But all of these visitors in Jerusalem for this holiday, Shavuot in Hebrew, Pentecost, we know it as in the Greek, they, they heard the message of Jesus. They heard these, these guys and gals glorifying God in their own native dialect, in their own language. And, and they ask, what, what does this mean? Well, think about this. I think it means that this is a universal language. <laughs> this is a universal message of Jesus. It's not dependent upon one culture. The gospel message about Jesus is not dependent upon one culture. It's not that one culture is better than another. This first presentation of the gospel message of the resurrection, after the resurrection, it came through a bunch of languages all at once. That's a rich truth. Consider the list, if you open your Bible or Bible app to Acts chapter 2, and you read verses 9 through 11, that's quite a list. It's a tedious list, actually, if we're honest. Why do you suppose Luke, who wrote Acts, would take the time to write out and specify all of these different groups that were present, watching this thing unfold? And I think at least part of the answer has to be because, because the message of Jesus, the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit in our life because Jesus rose from the dead and ascended. He's available to all, to all, not just some, not just a certain culture, not just a certain language, but he's available to all. And no one can say that the gospel message or that the word of God can only come through this one language. Even the Greek or the Hebrew of the Bible, 
we study them to learn the message and what happened, and it's, it's part of our due diligence to study Scripture. But your English Bible that you have is the Word of God. Every January, I get the privilege to go to Uganda, and they have the Bible in their language of Luganda, and it's the Word of God. Did you, did you know, sort of as a contrast, that in Islam, the Quran can only be trans, can only be in Arabic, I should say. Any other language, they believe that it ceases to be the Quran. If it's translated into any other language, it ceases to be the Quran. Because Arabic is superior in that thought. This is just not the case with Christianity. The gospel message judges all cultures. It doesn't elevate one above another. Yet it doesn't strip you of your heritage either. That's the beauty of the gospel message. When you come to faith, you begin to grow into the image of Jesus, but that expression may look different from different cultures in different parts of the world. Christianity is and should be the most uh, culturally diverse faith, diverse faith in the world. We can't say, we shouldn't say, and really we can't say, well, my Christianity is better than your Christianity, their Christianity that they practice over on that continent or in that country. Mine is better. This is a dangerous place to be because when we do that, what happens is we often look past the message, the content of the message that they're saying, and we begin to pick apart cultural differences. And we start valuing our culture above other cultures. And we say, well, my Christianity is superior. But that, that is not the message of the gospel. And I think this is part of why it came through all of those languages at once. And then when we talk about Pentecost and the issue of tongues, of course, uh, we would be tempted to talk about speaking in tongues and that whole thing, which is important. And we will teach through that in our series on the book of Acts, as we will encounter it often. But here, however, in Acts chapter 2, this is a demonstration of earthly languages. People were amazed to hear these, these Galileans, right, these country bumpkins, speaking these other earthly language. This is very different than what Paul is teaching on for the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, for example, because in this teaching where he says it should be accompanied with an interpretation, clearly he's assuming because the church doesn't know what's being spoken in that particular language. Well, my prayer this morning or today is that this is helpful. My prayer is that this is eye-opening and we get just the raw the raw teaching, the raw text of Scripture, what really is being conveyed. Pentecost is teaching us that this is a universal message. It, it, it challenges us that the whole gospel message is for the whole world. This life-changing truth of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, will express itself differently in different cultures while still being true to Jesus and the power of the resurrection. We learn that there is help and power from outside of us, which we absolutely need. Are, are you at a place, maybe, where you know that the problem is in here? You know that the problem is in you? I've got good news. I've, there's hope. There really is hope because there is life-changing power available to you right now. Life-changing power through the presence of the Holy Spirit. By putting your faith in Jesus, accepting that gift that he offers, there's power in the resurrection. And because Jesus ascended, we talked about this early in the Acts series, because he ascended, he, he gives the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. Now, what a powerful truth. There's life-changing power available to us right now, to you right now. And then number, number three, we've learned that there really is this, this inner assurance. And how many need that inner assurance? Man, I think that would be for all of us. In all of the issues of life, no matter if life is going smoothly right now, I mean, things are difficult and you feel like you're, you're treading water, maybe you're drowning in your life. There really is an inner assurance you can have through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to live this carefree life. Again, when I say carefree, I don't mean detached with your head in the clouds. I mean, you're living real life, but you can manage, you can face Issues head on because of the power of the Holy Spirit that is inside of your life. Not leaning to alcohol or trusting in some form, whether alcohol or, or something else, marijuana or drugs. Or I just need an escape. Man, that's the opposite. The power of the Holy Spirit honestly helps you deal with life's issues head on with a confidence and a peace because you've got someone who is with you. Someone who is with you and will never leave you.
let me end with, with this thought. The first Pentecost, the first uh, Shavuot, the first uh, Feast of Weeks, way, way back, way back, was for Israel to know that they were God's people, which he would use in this world. Part of the meaning of, of Shavuot or Pentecost. And then you fast forward the clock to where we're at. But now at this Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, after the resurrection, the whole world can know. <laughs> that they can be a part of the family of God because the Holy Spirit is available to all. What a powerful symbol, what a powerful representation of the truth of the gospel. That God delivered this holiday to the Jews all those years ago, and after the resurrection, the next step in sort of God's plan of salvation history is that the whole world can know. He's available to all. It's a global message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he really did rise from the dead, and that matters. That the world is different because Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father, and now the Holy Spirit is available to all who believe and to all who would ask to be filled and refilled with the powerful presence of Jesus. What, a, what an amazing truth. I end also with this last thought. Is the Holy Spirit available to all of us? Yes. Not only do we see that here in Acts chapter 2, but from Jesus' own mouth in Luke chapter 10, appropriately I chose Luke because Luke wrote the book of Acts, He's, he, he tells the story of what Jesus says, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Interesting in that context, if you take a moment to read it, you might say, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, won't God give good gifts to you? But that's not what he says, is it? He says, if you, being evil, right, you're not going to trick your children if they ask for something, you give them something else. But if they ask for something, you're going to give it to them. And if you ask, if you ask God to give you his Holy Spirit, he will. God bless you. I pray that this message encourages you and draws you closer into your relationship with Jesus.